Um, I guess, um, Marius, if you want to go over the uh, actual, um, the informal hub team's work in the past two weeks. Sure, my pleasure. So I will start like always with saying hi to everyone and also a reminder to add stuff to the discussion, to the agenda, if you want to discuss something in particular afterwards. Um, but yeah, yeah, what we did in the last uh, the last weeks, uh, yeah, the hub got upgraded to Gaia V11. It was uh, longer than uh, usual because uh, there was some migration happening, but still under 15 minutes. So thanks to all the validators and everybody that contributed, really cool. Uh, we also cut uh, Gaia V12, uh, the RC, the release candidate, which is with uh, liquid staking, with the liquid staking module. So it was a collaboration between binary, informal inclusion and stride. So a lot of people worked on this for quite a lot of time. Uh, so thanks everyone. Uh, also, I just got a uh, notification that the testnet, the public testnet and the replicated security testnet uh, was uh, was updated to this release candidate. So now tomorrow we'll cut the final release and uh, we'll put the proposal. So tomorrow or on Friday, the latest, which means that we keep up with the regular release of Gaia. This is exactly what we want to do and what we mentioned in previous meetings. Um, we want to have a monthly cadence of Gaia releases and to be kind of on a Wednesday, they are always upgrading the hub upgrades on a Wednesday and everything depends on that, right? Uh, so it takes two weeks to have the proposal up and all this stuff. So basically if we release uh, tomorrow, we kind of expect that uh, September 13, we upgrade the hub to V12. So we want to continue this Unless, of course, if one month we don't have anything to release, we don't release. We will not release garbage just for the sake of it. But um, yeah, we are uh, we are excited to get to that cadence. I think it will be better for validators or, and for everybody to to have this. Uh, plus, we can upgrade the dependency much uh, much more often. Cool. So. Um, Next, uh, after V12, so what we already are, we are working on it is uh, Gaia V13, and that's with cryptographic equivocation. And this is something that we are working for quite a bit of time. Uh, it's uh, it's not an easy thing to do, but uh, we are making progress. And now we are, especially after the the last uh, last weeks with all the commotion with uh, the proposal 818. Uh, we put even higher priority on this. So the target for that, again, as I said, it's to for the release candidate September 15. So a few days after the we upgrade the hub to V12, um, which means again, the, or it will end up on the hub somewhere mid-October. Um, so what we already have done is the light client equivocation and the jailing. Then uh, something that will, it's the code is already done. We are working on uh, testing for double signing and jailing. By jailing here, I mean um, tombstoning, of course, because it's uh, double signing stuff. Um, and uh, the thing that we are, uh, uh, wait, I see a comment. Uh, I like making. Oh yeah, no, this is all just great stuff, basically. Oh, okay. uh, cool, 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 cool. Yeah. like. The, I I think that now that we've done it IRL, um, you know I guess hindsight is twenty twenty, and maybe that approach just doesn't really uh, fit the use case, shall we say? Well, we we can uh, we can talk about this more in the at the at the end of the call in the discussion section, but yeah. Um... I, I wrote up, we, we had this last week and had Twitter space and released a, a blog post, I think too. Um, I basically wrote a thing on, on what went wrong uh, and why, um, but maybe we should get through the rest of the sort of uh, stuff that Mars is doing first. Well, good. Cool. So, uh, and the other thing, so that we are focusing is slashing, which is more complicated because proof of stake was not designed for cross uh, cross chain validation or cross chain staking or anything like this right it was meant for only one chain 
So now we are kind of changing that, but we don't want to change the behavior. We don't want to start slashing more or less, right? So we want to replicate the same behavior using kind of the same and without modifying heavily the, the second module. Actually, we don't want to modify the second module at all. So we have a proper solution that may take longer to implement. So for which we'll write an ADR and we'll this, it's quite a cool design using IBC and all the, all the stuff. And we are looking for a workaround. We have an idea of it. We just have to make sure that it's not, uh, it was very important to not slash somebody that doesn't deserve to be slashed, right? So to not slash somebody that didn't do anything. This is essential. So we want to make sure that uh, the workaround is good enough. So that's V13. And the other thing that uh, we are working on is, uh, and uh, we are making, we worked on in the last two weeks and will continue is uh, Gaia with SDK for 47. That's probably ending up in V14, uh, which again, it's, uh, it will be the release candidate. We, we just continue with this, it will be mid October. Um, so the reason it's later and not necessarily, for example, why don't we do it in September? we want to get a audit of the changes between 45 or the version of SDK that runs on Gaia and the latest version of 47. Uh, so 47.4. Um, so we already have an agreement with Talk Security that will start on August 28, a six week audit. Um, so that's one of the prerequisites and this kind of dictates when we can release because we shouldn't put something on the hub that is still in, in audit in case they find something we should fix it um of course if they find something major all this plan is delayed because we need to fix it mm -hmm. hopefully there will be nothing major mm -hmm. okay and uh, the other two things that are required is to upgrade the LSM to, to SDK 047. So at the moment, what we release in V12, it's uh, on 45, of course. And um, this shouldn't be a problem. Already uh, discussed with Inclusion and Stride, it will be a collaboration between the two teams and uh, they will handle it. Uh, it it should be quite straightforward from what I understood, but uh, let's see, it needs to be done. And uh, the actual refactoring of Gaia to work on 47, it's work in progress. Uh, since we are waiting on these two other things, it's not the highest priority at the moment. So we are focusing on all the other things, but it's clearly on our plan and uh, we have to do it. And I guess this is pretty much it. There are other things that are work in progress, but... Uh, I don't think it's worth discussing them now. Um, yeah, so I guess uh, Denise or someone from Haifa go over the, the test nets. Uh, sure, yeah, I guess, I think Udit um, had to go to the doctor, so he's not here. Um, so this morning we upgraded both the release test net and the provider test net to V12, went super smoothly. I think it was like under five minutes from Halt until blocks, which is exciting. Um, we've also been working on an equivocation monitoring bot uh, just to get more visibility into um, when equivocation events occur on mainnet. So if anyone has ideas for GIFs, <laughs> that would be fun to accompany an alert related to detecting someone equivocating, let us know. Um, we're looking for suggestions there to keep things kind of lighthearted and fun because equivocation is kind of a bummer when it happens to you. So we're kind of looking for ways to make it um, less of a, I don't know, scary thing. Um, that's the main yeah. thing. Our focus has been will be places lately. Yeah, this will be temp, this will be temporary because, uh, you know, hopefully we're going to have the automatic slashing in. Um, yes. and, uh, once, once that happens, then Hermes actually will be, um, triggering these slashes. Uh, so Hermes will be kind of like the bot. Any relayer will do it, but, uh, but until then, um, and it's even possible that we get the chain side, uh, you know, on-chain code done for the slashing, but Hermes doesn't have it yet. In that case, we, we might still use the bot to, to do the automatic slashes. Um, but until then, we'll use the bot to create um, the governance proposals to get created immediately and correctly. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So that'll, that, that'll come uh, soon. That'll land soon as a separate channel in Discord that folks can kind of like opt in and out of. Cool. Thanks. Um, all right, so I guess um, I guess uh, the 
we can we can then discuss the um we I, I could unless there's any questions or anyone else wants to say more we can go to the discussion stuff or have a few items is there anything else uh one quick question from the stride side we're expecting the upgrade to take longer because the upgrade handler had to iterate all the delegations it's possible that the reason it was so fast is that there just aren't many delegations on testnet uh whereas there will be many on mainnet does that check out denise and um it I don't know if I remember correctly, but Milan is also on the call, so we can confirm this. I think he talked to it. Uh, or with Dante. I think Dante, when he did the local test, so not the upgrade of the testnet, I think the local test, there is one test that is stateful. So I think it, it that works with you just dump the state, the entire state from the hub, and you try to update that one. And that took a few minutes milan am i correct um that yeah that, that's correct but I, I don't know uh what the state of delegations would be uh if they're just carried over i don't know if that would still be the case yeah but it i don't expect it to double like unless people really get excited about the hub which would be great um i don't see how uh how the number of delegations will increase in a few weeks considerably yeah, I, I can I can check uh, on on the test net see see what the state is with that with that particular metric and then come back. Um, but yeah, in general, I think this upgrade so for V twelve should take longer than before. But so last time it took fifteen minutes, but we didn't have to. There we just were uh, we were basically sending back some tokens, so we were cleaning up the state of the liquidity module. I think now it's uh, it's like iterating through all the delegations should take longer, but I'm not sure. Okay, that's helpful. Uh, it's good to hear that the testnet upgrade used used mainnet state. Okay, so I think if that's settled, um, we can talk about the discussion items. And uh, the first one is um, I'll I'll actually go with eight one eight first, just because we had already started talking about that. Um, so basically, uh, I I found it pretty interesting. Um, well, it's obviously, you know, also it was a bad it's a bad situation. Um, so it's you know unfortunate, but also interesting. Um. Basically, what happened with 818 is that somebody submitted, uh, you know, we had this mechanism to submit slash proposals. And we were thinking, well, if some if there's a big attack or whatever, uh, then somebody's going to submit this proposal and it's going to get voted on. And it's going to go in front of governance. And so we'll let governance figure it out. And um, so we were kind of thinking, well, it should work because governance, you know, it's the same voting power that can, uh, you know, sync a vote as can censor double signing evidence anyway. So it's like, you know, we figured out you know, security uh, assumptions are basically the same. We didn't, the thing, the problem is that we didn't really think about a scenario where it wasn't a big attack, uh, but it was just double signing accidental. Nobody really, you know, that didn't really bother anybody when it happened. Nobody really even noticed it necessarily. Um, and we didn't think about, you know, yeah, what, what happens if someone submits a wrong proposal and then Nobody actually notices it's wrong until a few days later. And then by then it's too late to submit another proposal. It's like, it's kind of like we were, we were thinking about like the worst case scenario so much. We didn't even think about like, you know, the, uh, sort of, you know, this sort of, uh, sort of scenario. So it's, um, you know, so what we, what we could have done differently, we could have certainly like been monitoring, like we could have had a bot and been monitoring and, um, submitted the proposal ourselves to make sure it was done. Right. Um, I also think another another factor that came up was um, the fact that there was a debate about whether to slash. And I think that's another interesting factor here because it's like um, it, that wasn't really it wasn't really intended that there was going to, you know, it was it was governance was intended to decide whether like it met the criteria of, of like being a real like double signing and not fake. Uh, it wasn't really necessarily intended to be like, you know, um to decide whether it's okay to slash if it's if it's uh um you know like an accidental double signing so um that's another thing where if we had we i think we could have somewhat maybe not completely prevented it um but we could have set expectations more clearly 
um, had a thing in the actual proposal, the, uh, what was it, the V9 upgrade that brought in interchange security and brought in this mechanism. We could have had some kind of constitution that would have said, um, you know, the, 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 the purpose of this feature is for validators to determine whether it was a real double signing and not just a, um, you know, and not, not a fake malicious, like completely bogus double signing packet from the consumer chain. And, you know, not to, to decide whether they should slash on the fly and have something where, you know, by voting in V9, people would already be agreeing on what the procedure was supposed to be instead of having it be like this thing where it was just like, uh, it ended up being kind of up in the air. So that's another thing that could have gone differently. And, uh, you know, um, so of course, I'll get into what we're doing for the cryptographic equivocation uh, verification, which will be auto slashing. Um, but the other thing I'll say is the reason it's interesting is that I have proposed, uh, we talked about this on this on this call a bunch of times already, and I've proposed on the forum, it's been discussed on the forum, but I proposed this thing called fraud votes. Um, so for um, mechanisms that we need fraud proofs for, um, the idea was you could use something like the equivocation votes to vote on fraud proofs. And I think that, um, for example, for mesh security, you need fraud proofs, or if you want to do it right, you need fraud proofs. And so I think that like this experience has been very interesting because fraud votes will be this, the same exact kind of situation. And in both cases, it's the same thing. It's like, you want to do things right with this cryptographic mechanism, but it's not ready yet. And so before it's ready, you say, well, for this range of cases, we're going to like governance sort it out. And so I think that when we do the, if we come back to the fraud votes, um, I mean, for implementing fraud votes is actually very, very easy. Um, but if we come back to the fraud votes and, and, and decide to really do them, which we will have to kind of decide on once we, you know, if, if uh, with, with once mesh security is closer to being ready, um, then it's kind of, um, th this will be a very, uh, a, a very good learning experience to, to look at how that how that gets designed. So, um, yeah, I think there's going to have to be a lot of thought about fraud votes. One of the other things I'll say about fraud votes is that it's even more ambiguous. Um, so, the a fraud proof is is just a proof that the validator uh, normally is a proof the validator did an invalid state transition. So that means that means basically means they ran the wrong binary. That's what it is. And from in a, in a cosmos sense, um, so anytime. You know, if you approach naively, any anytime an app hash error, a validator gets an app hash error, which is very common um, on Cosmos, that could actually generate a fraud proof um, in in some cases. And so, there's going to be ambiguous situations that arise, like, um, and and so we're going to have to figure out how governance is supposed to deal with that, whether governance is capable of dealing with that and stuff like that. So, for ex example, um, and well, look, okay, in in this case, just to say, in this case, it was very clear. Clear cut, like it. It was very, very clear cut. No, no dispute whatsoever on that they double signed, and there's no dispute whatsoever on that it was an accident. Um, and it, we, yet we still had a lot of debate. And so with with a fraud, with a fraud vote, what could happen is like let's say there's a consumer chain on mesh security or whatever, and there's a hack on the consumer chain. There's some vulnerable code on the consumer chain, and uh, the validators update except there's like a, a few validators or one validator who doesn't update and still is running that the vulnerable code and they're running the vulnerable code and they actually propose a block where there is a transaction that's attempting to take advantage of that vulnerability um at that point that's very i mean it, that could be an accident or it could be malicious and it's very very hard to say in an absolute sense which one it was so whether or not governance can deal with that kind of ambiguity is something we're going to have to have to think hard about. But yeah, um, is there any questions on that or, or comments? No, I, I I like the retrospective view of it. I also thought that this was like a great playground for learning. Um, I, I felt bad for the validators in the end. Um, I'm sure it was really stressful, but you know we didn't get into this because it would be easy. Um, and uh, in terms of these fraud votes, Jihan, I, I hesitantly agree with you that, that we're a long way off from being able to programmatically say, oh, this is, is clear fraud. Are you completely right that, you know, just, just getting an app hash error could cause this? Uh, and 
And so I, I do think that by informing the community better about intent and then getting rid of the governance for like just an equivocation slash, but as we move toward mesh and things that mesh is likely to enable, you know, like POS chains that are not Cosmos chains that are staking on the hub or, or what have you, uh, that I, could you imagine the, the complexity goes up dramatically. So I, I think that in the end, we will need to use governance for slashes and maybe just the best way is to really educate people on it and make sure that there are like voting guidelines for validators, for example. Well, the other thing is you could also say it's just not going to work without like real fraud proofs or, or ZK proofs. Um, so that, that's, that's another viewpoint you could take, but that's obviously going to, um, you know, things are going to take a, a lot longer then because that stuff's not ready. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I think that given, I think you and I had a conversation recently about, you know, the market for security, and given how hot that is, I tend to agree that it's something where we probably should not wait to be able to create the actual proof system. I'll throw out a quick example. Imagine that, you know, we integrate IBC on, let's say, near, right? And we work out some mesh security system, near joins mesh security. We would then be saying that every chain that's being secured with near tokens uh, needs to be able to prove these fraud events. I think that's, it's not impossible. In fact, I'm confident we'll do it. But the timeline gets really long. Yeah, I mean, that's the nice thing about fraud votes is you can kind of hand wave it away um, and say governance will figure it out. But, uh, you know, the, then the question is, will governance figure it out? <laughs> so I guess that's that's what it comes down to. I mean, um, but yeah, so moving on, just to, to move on, I guess we'll, we'll be revisiting this for sure, obviously. I, I think that actually the mesh security team, um, they are even working on as it happens. I remember I had I had um I talked to to Jake on Jake Hartnell on that team and 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 they were they were actually working on some kind of fraud vote thing. Um or Jake was was gonna take a look at it. Um so I, it'll 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 be interesting to see where things go. Um so Anyway, as it as it is with double signing for sure, we are going to have cryptographic equivocation verification because it's pretty easy. I mean, it's easy compared to fraud proofs. Um, not easy, you know, in an absolute sense. But um, basically, where we're at right now with that is um, we have the code which will tombstone for light client attacks, um, and we have the code which will uh, which will which will tombstone for consensus um, consensus double signing. And so consensus double signing is what is the most common type of double signing. It's the no, it's the regular sort of normal um, type. And um, that's what happened uh, in 818. Um, so we'll have the code. Uh, we're, we're just working on testing the code that will will tombstone for that. It means it takes the validator out of the validator set forever. Um, slashing is a little bit more difficult because for slashing, you have to know the height at which the infraction happened. And you have to know the validator's power at that height. And so that's an interesting one because the infraction, even though the evidence gets submitted automatically and stuff to the provider chain, yeah, there could be an arbitrary amount of delay. You don't know. Uh, up to you know three weeks of delay. It really theoretically is what you're supposed to support because that's the unbonding period. But um so that's an interesting one. So you need to know, um, you need to know what the when the infraction happened. To slash in the provider chain, you need to know what provider chain height the infraction happened at, and um, and so and so the question is, how do we get that information from the consumer chain? Um, how do we map that to the provider chain height? We have stuff where we have a VSC. We have VSC IDs, so VSC IDs are the validator set update, and those are mapped to both the provider and consumer chain heights. Um, but uh, yeah, how how to how to how to get that? Like how to figure out what the height was on the consumer chain? There's stuff like where we can get it from like the IBC headers or something. 
Um, there's also questions about the fact you have to trust the consumer chain about that, whether that's a problem, because we ideally want to have an untrusted consumer chain, but in this case, we would have to trust the consumer chain about what the height was or what the VSC ID was at the time, um, because you're kind of verifying it out of their IBC headers. Um, so the application could be tampering with it or something. Um, I think probably that's not a big deal because probably the application would never really be incentivized to want to tamper with it. Um, but that's, it just needs to be looked at. Um, so that, that'd be the way to do it right is to somehow verify when the double signing happened exactly, and then map it back to the provider height, uh, and get the, and get the validator power at that height and stuff. Um, so yeah, so, but right now our code only tombstones. And so one way we could do slashing, we're looking at this right now, this would be very easy to implement is we would slash using the power and the infraction height at the time the evidence was received on the provider. So not the time that it actually happened on the consumer, but when the evidence actually came in was submitted to the provider. And so um, we're looking at that as a temporary solution. Um, and we basically the, um, the thing with that is, is it's, you know, it's obviously not exactly the way things are supposed to work. Uh, one of the biggest issues with it is that a validator could, like if you have this scenario, the sort of, uh, yeah, like a scenario where you have like a val, you have some huge whale has got a billion dollars or whatever, and they, you know, buy a bunch of Adam, um, a third of the market cap, you know, obviously, like, obviously that's not e e easy either, but like they buy a bunch of Adam and then they like, um, you know, um, use it to double sign on a consumer chain. Like maybe what they could do is they could undelegate like immediately on the hub, they undelegate immediately after they double sign on the consumer chain. And even though the evidence comes in after like, you know, 30 seconds from the relay or whatever, it still uh, would end up, you know, they, they would end up getting away with it um, and they wouldn't be slashed. So that that is a shortcoming of using the height at which the evidence came in. Um, and another shortcoming is that well, the, the way that slashing works in the staking module is it's very, is like very complicated. Um, so it's, uh, it's actually, we're not actually sure it's even working correctly right now. Um, but that's a different matter. Um, but, but we have to look at basically what, what, what's the difference in who gets slashed and by how much um, in this scenario where you just use the height that you received, um, that you received the, uh, the evidence. And it, to me, it seems like it probably is an okay solution, but we're going to want to go with the solution where we verify the height and the power from the from you know, from the consumer chain instead of just taking it, uh, you know, at the time it was received. Uh, but yeah, any any questions about that? No, not really. Okay, cool. Uh, then I'll move on to eight ten. Prop eight ten is the uh, fee. Um, the, 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 what do you call it? The fee, um, uh, what's the name for it, Jacob? Automatic. It's fee, fee abstraction. Tokens for fee. Ah, that's yeah, right. Fee yeah, yeah, fee abstraction. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't mention this in the discussion on the forum because I didn't want to confuse matters. Um, the intention of this, but just to be clear, the intention of this is that if I receive neutron tokens, um, as part of my, you know, as part of my rewards, I can then turn around and use them for transaction fees on the hub, right? Yeah, absolutely. That That's the okay. precise intention. Yep. All right, cool. That's the intention. Now, I'm worried that what could happen, and depending on how the fee abstraction module is set up, which maybe you can answer, Jacob, but what could happen is that um, um, I'm worried that what might happen is that the fee abstraction module would sell uh, all neutron tokens that came in from neutron or any consumer chain or stride or whatever, it would sell those tokens immediately when they came in from the consumer chain, um, for Adam. And that would not be the, uh, that would not be the intention, right? That is not the intention, nor is yeah, it exactly. the first moment. Yeah, it only swaps it, what it does really specifically. Okay. Without getting into the weeds on like, uh, how it does what it does, but what it does is it'll collect fees that are non-atom fees. And those fees are going to get batched up, sent over to Osmo, swapped for atom, and sent back to the hub. 
Uh, the idea yeah. behind the fee abstraction module was to allow chains to take fees that are not their native token without sacrificing sovereignty. A uh, really neat side benefit is constant, although rather small, buy pressure on the token. Yeah, so so anyway, the, the point here is though that like the way that uh, the distribution system in interchain security works is that it just puts the tokens from the consumer chain into the fee pool. And so if the fee abstraction module is just grabbing whatever tokens that are not the native tokens that it finds in the fee pool and, and swaps them, then it's possible that it would grab the tokens that just came in from a consumer chain um, and not only the tokens that somebody had used for fees. That was what I was that, wondering about. That could be possible. That's possible. And I will raise that. Um, yeah, let me add you to a telegram group. We have a fee abstraction telegram group. This is an amazingly good question for that group. I I don't off the top of my head know the answer, but I, I share your concern here. Um, really yeah. good that you've that. So that's, that would that'd be the only thing is we don't want a situation where consumer chain tokens are just being auto dumped. Um, I mean, I guess that's, that could be a way you do things, um, but I don't think that's what the consumer chains we have now signed up for. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. Let's make sure that that does not happen. Okay, good stuff. All right. So then the, the last one, um, this is a minor point. I don't know. It's not, maybe not very interesting, um, but basically um, Neutron, uh, Neutron had this issue and they still have it, I believe, where they kind of go down or have, high memory consumption or how general unreliability having to do with high computation memory use um, every few days. And uh, we, we figured out that it was, uh, they, well, they figured out that it was because of this um, inefficiency in um, the way that the uh, SDK stores downtime information. And uh, as it happens, the SDK team had fixed it for SDK 50. They actually had fixed it even before this problem came up on Neutron. Um, and they actually suggested, hey, could this be it? And so, um, uh, and it has to just to not to get too into the weeds with this, but what it has to do with is, is the fact that, um, you know, when you're recording downtime, it's just not being stored very efficiently right now. And, and what happens is that with soft opt-out, as is used on consumer chains, um, you just have a lot more downtime to store. Um, and so, so basically, the, the situation right now is that the um, Neutron team has backported this to SDK 47. Uh, they're going to want to use it in their next upgrade to solve their problem. I believe that Stride may want to use it as well. I don't think Stride is the problem as bad, but I think there might be a, a little bit of something going on. And it's just generally something where it's just purely an upgrade. And it's obviously going to be very good for any consumer chain to use the upgraded code. Um, and so basically... Uh, Neutron's going to be running with it. They're, they have their own fork they're maintaining. The question becomes, though, if we have other consumer chains that want to use it, um, the problem's fixed in 50. And I don't know how soon people are upgrading to 50. But if there's other consumer chains that want to use it and they're using 47 and not 50, um, then the question becomes, you know, do they just use Neutron's fork? Do we want to have a separate place to maintain this fork? You know, what do we want to do with it? So, um that's kind of, uh, I don't know how serious of a question that is. Obviously, if we do nothing, neutrons just have their fork, stride pull from that, it doesn't really matter, or anyone who wants it. Um, unfortunately, I suggested my prefer preference was, was that the SDK team would, would actually cut a version 0 0.48 with this fix, uh, but they don't want to do that. So, uh, I mean, really, I think this is off topic, but I think the, the problem would be solved in general if they were to use major versions. Um, but that's uh, uh that's kind of true. Uh, can, can I throw out another suggestion? Mm -hmm. Uh, which, which would be to maybe just jump to 50, but this depends on timeline. Uh, when would you like to upgrade the hub to 47? It doesn't have to do with the 47 on the hub, though. It's, it's on the consumer chains. Oh, it's on the okay. consumer chains. Okay, yeah. Uh, uh, and you're you're just talking about making sure that they don't need to run a forked SDK. Is that right? Well, Neutron will be running a forked SDK. The question is, depending on when 50 actually is finished or whatever, um, there is going to be more and more consumer chains running this forked 
version of 47. That's that's what it comes down to. Um, but yeah, sorry, what was that? Tomatoes before they're bad. Okay. No, I mean, somebody's, uh, okay. somebody's not muted. Um, yeah, so that, that, that's it. And I think that um, it's not a big deal, um, even if it doesn't get put in the SDK, neutral have a fork. And I guess if we end up with a situation where 50 is just not coming out or whatever, and um, everyone's using neutrons fork, you know, maybe we'll reassess the situation. Um, but yeah. Oh, yeah, works. Um, cool. I don't have anything else. Um, if anybody else has anything else to add, um, go ahead. Um, or not. Uh, How do I get out of this? I guess. I guess not. Um, cool. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, and I'll, mm -hmm. I'll uh, see you later. Yeah. Thanks. Bye, everyone.